Well, as the great Minnesota get-together moves into its fourth day, uh, summer rushes toward its end. We began a short series last week called Life Happens. Uh, we're living for a few weeks in the classic statement from Paul found in Romans 8. Let's begin by reading it together today. Here it is. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, we reviewed last week how all things, both good and bad, happen to all people, whether we're believers or not. We, we live in the same world where things sometimes simply don't work out. The good news is that God is at work in all those things. That's the bold proclamation of faith we just made when we read that verse. Doesn't mean I get whatever good circumstances I want. It means God is accomplishing his purpose through both the good and the bad things to produce the character of Jesus in me. We emphasized last week how this is something that we know that's what the verse says. We don't just guess it could happen, hope that it will. We are learning how we find God. We find God in the stuff of our lives from one moment to the next. And this week is one of the toughest where we really experience tough stuff when life happens. We're dealing this week with something we can't control. It's those times when healing is needed. Shortly after we moved into this facility, there was a problem with the wheels on this drum stand that's here on the stage. Uh, the wheel over on this corner over here, it, it had come off, and so Sue and I were working on this, and uh, we kind of propped it up, uh, trying to get things to go back on, and it just wasn't working out, and so... I reached my hand under here. As Sue was saying, don't put your hand under there. And as you might guess, I, this story wouldn't be being told unless this had collapsed and it fell on my fingers. And Sue's trying to get something to lift this off. And as I'm just going to get this off, it really hurts. And she's there trying to get it off. And she's saying, you know, I told you not to put your fingers under there. <laughs> My body had this amazing set of responses taking place through a process called nociception. Tremendous pain signals were being sent to my brain saying, get this thing off my fingers. Once my fingers were free, bruises started forming. This process, also called ecchymosis, indicates bleeding under the skin due to trauma. My body also responded, at least that's what the experts say, by sending platelets to help stop the bleeding and prevent infections. Soon after that, polymorphonuclear neutrophils like little Pac-Men just gobbling up whatever was in their path, would have moved in to do their job of eating up any bacteria. My body did all of these amazing things, and I learned two important lessons. Never give Sue a reason to say, I told you so. I should have listened to her. Number two, healing happens. It's an amazing thing about our world. Healing happens. The fact healing happens, it's, it's, it's true, and it's not just in our bodies. As you drive through places where wildfires have devastated the landscape, Judy and I did that a couple of years ago in the Colorado foothills of Colorado Springs. Uh, you see ugly, charred scenes, but then you notice that there are little patches of green. I saw a picture in Lahaina yesterday, the other day where it showed one little taro leaf coming up out of the ground where all of that life was lost, a sign of hope. One of the wonders of nature as it heals is how some trees, like the giant sequoia, they require fire to release the seeds from their pine cones so new trees will grow. It's as though God has somehow built healing into the way the earth works. 
a small nation called Israel came to believe this reality that healing happens. And it says something significant about the kind of God, the kind of being that God is. Stay with me for a minute on this. One way you can divide people up is that you are either a saver or a thrower. A saver or a thrower. And it seems as though most marriages often have one of each. You know, and even though that piece of furniture has been in the family for a couple of generations and you want to fix it, if you're married to a thrower, they'll tell you it's time to move on to something newer and better. And when this happens often enough, if you are a saver married to a thrower, you may find yourself hesitant to tell your spouse that you're not feeling that well. (laughs) Time for the new. Time to move on. Well, Israel... Israel came to believe that God is a saver. And when God makes something and it breaks down, he wants to save it. God is a healer. And they express the truth that healing happens through some amazing word pictures. After Israel was delivered from Egypt on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses this message for the people. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. This is a beautiful picture of God's loving care. Some of you know Ray Vanderlaan through his videos where he brings the Bible to life as he's on location in Israel. Uh, He tells of how a mama eagle will care for its eaglet who may not be able to fly by tucking it into her wings in order to carry it. Over time, this became an important picture of God's protection and healing. We read in Psalms, Psalm 91, He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Now stay with me here as we dig deeper so that we can fly higher. Uh, The word for wing in Hebrew is kanaf. Kanaf, the word is also used for the corner of a garment. Uh, Jewish rabbis wore prayer shawls, and there were tassels at the bottom of those shawls protruding much like wings. The tassels were to remind them of the commandments of God. And I was telling the staff the other day, if you go to a Jewish service, if you go to synagogue, when they bring the Torah out and they go through the crowd, People will take the edges, the the, the tassel on the robe that they're wearing to be able to touch it, to touch it to the Torah out of their respect for God's commandments and what he wants to do in our lives because they exist. Those commandments exist, the Jews believe, for the healing of the world. Over time, this developed into a promise of hope. And when the final book of the Old Testament was written and the world was waiting 400 years of silence for the coming of the promised Messiah. In Malachi 4, we read, the Lord of heaven's armies says, the day of judgment is coming. God does give that warning. Burning like a furnace on that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. Fire of righteousness. But for you, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture. Oh, the symbolism, the pictures. Over time, the idea rose in Israel that one day the Messiah would come. And in his kanaf, in the corners of his garment, there would be healing in his wings. Uh, We celebrate this truth every Christmas season when we sing, Hark, the herald angels sing. Uh, The third stanza begins, Hail, the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail, the Son of Righteousness, the one of whom Malachi wrote. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in heaven. His wings, his wings. They believe this in Israel, and healing happens. 
Uh, they saw God at different times in remarkable ways. Uh, there were miracles, sometimes healings. Uh, they weren't the, uh, just spread at random all through, but periodically, especially at important times, when God is going to reveal something special about himself, about his kingdom, healings like the one experienced by King Hezekiah happened. Uh, even when someone but not from Israel, like Naaman, he was healed of leprosy when he finally listened to God and obeyed the instructions to wash himself in the muddy Jordan River, something he said that he would never do. Healing happens. One day, a rabbi named Jesus came from up there to down here, and he came into the world. He was a teacher. He was also a healer. Uh, healing was at the center of his ministry as he gives a foretaste of what God is going to do when he finally completely heals the world someday in the future. There was a man named Jairus. He's described to us as a ruler of the synagogue, which means he was one of the guys involved in discussing what do we do about Jesus. Well, on this day, he's come asking Jesus for help. His daughter his daughter is dying. And they are on the way. Jesus has said, sure, let's go. They are on their way when they are intercepted by a desperate woman. She emerges from the large crowd seeking help. And Mark tells us a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she'd gotten no better. She'd gotten no better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. We're given a glimpse here into the backstage world of the gospel writers. What Mark writes, it's also found in Matthew and in Luke. And when Luke writes, he leaves out the part about how she'd suffered so much under the care of many doctors. She'd spent all her money on doctors. She found no relief. What did Luke do for a living? He was a doctor. Check with Dr. Luke when you get to heaven to see why he left that detail out. It'd be kind of an interesting thing. But imagine being this woman. 12 years, suffering with anemia, as she bleeds. She is weak. She's financially destitute. And that's not even the worst part. She's also suffering spiritually and emotionally. Uh, the Old Testament law left her with a very real problem that she is considered unclean. When a woman had bleeding because of her monthly cycle, she was considered unclean. Uh, the, this woman, she is bleeding all the time. That means anyone and anything she touches becomes unclean. The place where she slept, it would be unclean. The chair where she sat, it would be unclean. Anyone who came into contact with her would be unclean and not able to go to worship in the temple. And so there was a stigma attached to this. Uh, people may have concluded she must have sinned somehow. They often did that with illness. It's because they have sinned. She must have done something wrong to be cursed to this extent. For some reason, God must be displeased with her. She's really done it. If she were a mother, she would not have been allowed to touch her children. Imagine not being able to touch your child or to comfort them when they might need a little kiss. Mommy, just kiss it and make it feel better. If she were married, her husband would not be allowed to touch her. Uh, perhaps the marriage, we're not told, perhaps the marriage had ended because of this. But in her desperation, can you hear her as she lies in bed every night pleading, God, please. Heal me. Every morning when she wakes up, maybe she's thinking, maybe today. Or maybe she gave up thinking that a long time ago. That it's just another hopeless, helpless day. 
And then she hears about this rabbi named Jesus. The word is he's coming to town and he's able to heal people. She comes up with this crazy idea. Mark says she had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched, touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Now, for your old-time TV viewers, this feels like it could be a storyline for an episode of I Love Lucy. Because whenever anyone famous was coming to town, Lucy was always coming up with wild ideas to be able to meet this person without her husband, Ricky, finding out about it. And of course, Ricky, because Lucy always messed it up, Ricky would find out and would always say the same thing to her. Lucy, you've got some splaining to do. This woman with a crazy Lucy-type idea approaches Jesus so she can touch him, thinking this will be enough for her to be healed. It's common to touch someone when you want something, you need something from them. The physical connection helps make that request more personal. There's just something about touching someone. For example, if you're a little bored right now, uh, just start tapping the person next to you. You might get something out of that. This woman has a plan. If I can just touch his robe, why, why would she think this could help? It's not just the clothes she wants to touch. It's the corner. It's the corner of his robe, of his prayer shawl, of his kanaf. This woman, out of every person in Israel, she gets it. This is the one we have been waiting for. For the one with healing in his wings, if I can just touch his kanaf. And so she does, and immediately, Mark says, immediately, immediately, she could feel the difference. The bleeding stopped. She could feel, she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible, terrible condition. What an unbelievable, absolutely electric moment. She once again knows what it's like to feel whole be normal. Thinking she found what she was looking for, she's not ready for what comes next. Mark continues, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around to the crowd and he asked, who touched my robe? And I don't think he's saying that in an accusatory way. It's not out of anger. Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who'd done it. Then, did their eyes meet? The frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. She looks at Jesus as Jesus is looking at her, and this is her Lucy, you've got some splaining to do moment. She falls there. She, she is scared to death. She knows that she has broken Jewish law. By touching Jesus, she has made him unclean. She tells Jesus what she's done. The New International and New American Standard both translate the Greek directly and precisely, saying she told him the whole truth. We aren't giving her exact words. That may be, that may be so we can put ourselves in the place of this woman so that we have the opportunity. We have the opportunity to tell Jesus where we need his healing. You'll have that opportunity in a few moments. She may have told Jesus something like, Jesus, I gave up so long ago. It's like I've never had enough faith. And what faith I did have, it's been so beaten down until there just doesn't seem to be any hope at all in my life. 
at this point, everything is lost. I am a failure. I have failed. I've failed physically, financially, spiritually. Then I heard about you, and I felt hope, and so I touched your robe. And with that, she waits. She's terrified because she knows what's supposed to happen next. She's broken the law. She's made him unclean. Plus, he is a teacher. What is he going to do? She thinks whatever it is, it's not going to be good. Jesus speaks. Daughter. No one has called her daughter for a long time. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering's over. He calls her a daughter of Israel, a daughter of God. She's been healed. And reading this again, I started wondering, why does Jesus do this? The woman's been healed. She's been suffering. She's been made better. Why does Jesus single her out and force her to identify herself? Why does he make her talk with him in front of this crowd? I think he does this because he's giving her, he's giving physical healing to more than just her. He wants her to know the healer. And in getting to know the healer, he lets the rest of the people know this is the kind of person I want to get to know. By his actions, he tells everyone, it's okay not to be okay. Jesus wants people to know he pretty much specializes in people who aren't okay. And when you stop to think about it, you realize that people who think they are okay, they're the ones who don't always do so well with Jesus. It's important to set this account into its original context because at the start, Jesus has been approached by a wealthy leader of the synagogue seeking help for his dying daughter. Why are these two accounts brought together uh, where the story of the woman exists within the other story? Jairus is there first. He may have been thinking, hey, wait a minute here, lady. I was here first. You can't be cutting into the line like this. Take a number and wait until Jesus and I are finished. According to the rules of society, he had every right to be thinking that way. He is a man. He has money. He has status. He is a leader in the synagogue. On the other hand, she is a woman. We don't even know her name. She is anonymous. She has no status. We know she has no money. Worst of all, she is ceremonially unclean. Jesus interrupts his time with the somebody to make time for the nobody. Because with Jesus, nobodies are somebodies. What starts as a good story about Jesus going to help a man, everyone expects that he should be helped, turns into a fabulous story about helping someone most other people don't even know or even care that she exists. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote the Lord of the Rings series. He was a Christ follower who loved this idea that God is a healer. His books are filled with images of wounds and scars that need healing. Uh, we see this in Frodo and Gollum with the wounds that they have from carrying the ring. Mordor is a wounded land that needs healing. The images of wounds needing to be healed come up over and over again, and it lends tremendous meaning to one of Tolkien's best lines. For it is said in old lore, the hands of the kings are the hands of a healer, and so, so shall the rightful king be known. In the ancient world, it was thought that kings had the ability to heal because of their strength, because of their power, and healing would demonstrate that power and solidify their right to rule. Healing was always the result of their strength. It verified their greatness. And that was true except for one king, the king risen with healing in his wings. He doesn't heal to show off his strength. Instead, the way he heals is he takes our pain and he bears our suffering. Uh, the punishment that brings us peace was placed on him. By his wounds, we are healed. By the head that wore the crown of thorns, the back that carried that splintered cross, by his side that was pierced by a spear, and by the hands that had nails driven through them, 
Those are the hands of the healer. The truth is, life happens, and healing is sometimes needed. We aren't in control of what happens to us. The good news is God can use the hard spots we face in life for his purpose because we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. One of the names for God is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. There is a Jehovah Rapha prayer that says, Father, thank you for being Jehovah Rapha. You are the God who heals me. I thank you for your healing power in my life, now and for eternity. May no area of my life be kept from your healing touch. Amen. Here's the question. Where do you need healing. That certainly includes physical issues, but it goes far beyond that. It includes uh, emotions. It includes relationships. It, it may be that there is guilt, that there is shame. It might involve the sting of failure. In a few moments, uh, Sue and Barry are going to come, and Sue is going to sing a special song she prepared for this time. And we're going to give you today the opportunity to just come forward and pray. Just pray the Jehovah Rapha prayer. Uh, you need to realize this is not something where we're, this is not something like you see on TV, you know, where they do the dramatic thing and they come and say, be healed and throw your crutches away and walk out. This is coming like the woman. If I could just touch, if I could just touch his robe, to just kneel at his feet and just surrender whatever it is. That's the note today. It's the surrender of whatever it is to be able to say, Jehovah Rapha, I'm giving this over to you for you to use in whatever way you deem best to accomplish your purpose in my life. May no area be kept from your healing touch. Amen. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to ask us to bow our heads and we're going to begin to pray. You, wherever you are, in a moment, Sue will be singing. And if you want to come and kneel, uh, there are people where if needed, they'll come and pray with you. If we don't have enough, maybe some of you who were trained for the Celebrate Minnesota, that you would come and step in to pray as well. And if you're at a point where you're going, you know, we've left the water in the baptistry, and it's warm, and John is prepared, to, he's got the clothes here. If you come today and say, I'm ready to make that proclamation of faith and baptism, we'll bring you right into the water today to be baptized as well. Quite a way to end the summer, don't you think? Let's bow in the presence of Jehovah Rapha. Jesus, the son of righteousness who has healing in his wings. And pray. And then Sue and Barry will lead us. And if you want to come, you can come. As you are led. This is solely between you and Jesus. Desperation, 
something about like that woman coming and saying I reach out today Jesus trusting you and so our Lord for those today who have taken that step we would pray that in your spirit through your spirit that that meeting that that meeting would be as real and life changing as when that woman reached out to touch your robe. We thank you, Jesus, that in your kingdom that you make nobodies, somebodies. That when we're willing to acknowledge that we're not okay, you say, that's exactly why I'm here. And then, Jesus, as we go out into this world, Uh, This world where we often complain about how awful it's becoming and all of the bad things that are taking place, we realize that you send us to be your salt and your light 
that healing, that healing might take place. Make us those agents of healing, Jesus, to the glory of your name. May the sun of righteousness shine brightly in our area through us. It's for you, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. If any of you need to talk, I'll be here, others. But it's talking to Jesus. I can't imagine what I could do that Jesus can't. If talking to Jesus has been sufficient. That surrender is the step to be able to say, he is my source of hope and help. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go then this week.